What we want to do today is talk about how close these Taylor polynomials are to the actual functions. So if we write a Taylor polynomial for sine, and we go to the fifth degree term, or, or whatever term we decide to go to, we want to know how close that's actually going to be. And if we can figure out how close it is, um, or if we can decide how many terms we need to get within a certain, uh, within a certain range or a certain error of what we want, um, then that's going to be really helpful. So what we want to do is we want to look at how we build the Taylor polynomial. And so a Taylor polynomial looks like this. Um, this is centered at A. So this is essentially the formula that I gave you the other day. We take the value of the function plus the, the value of the function at A plus the derivative evaluated A times X minus A plus the second derivative evaluated A over 2 factorial times X minus A squared and so on. And so this is the general term. And the formula I gave you just was the sigma notation with the general form here. Um, starting with n equals 0 and going from there. So the problem with this formula is this right here at the end. This, this really gives us trouble. Why does this give us trouble? So what, what these ellipses are saying is we're going to do something infinitely many times. Is that practical? No. In, in the real world, we're going to have to stop somewhere. We're going to have to decide that's enough. And so what we're going to try to do here is figure out how much is enough for, for whatever purpose we have. Um, so what we're going to do, instead of the ellipses there, we're going to just add on a remainder term and say all these other terms are going to add up to some value uh, that depends on x. And so we're just going to add on this remainder term here. So instead of saying that we have an infinite Taylor polynomial, we could say we have a finite Taylor polynomial that's close. And then we have this remainder term here that's going to get us the rest of the way. The trick is knowing what this remainder term is. And there's a lot of math that goes into it. Um, and it's, it's kind of a high-level concept. But the, the idea is if we go far enough, we're, we're going to get to the point where we're going to have a pretty close approximation. We want this remainder to be small. We want whatever these terms at the end are going to add up to, and when I say the terms at the end, there's infinitely many of them, but whatever they add up to, as long as it converges, we want it to be small. So we want this remainder here to be small. And we can use some math here to figure out that that remainder is going to be this. Now, this is a formula here. You're going to have to know how to use it. Um, you are actually going to have to be able to, you're going to, I'm going to expect you to know this, but you're not going to have to memorize it as it is. Um, we'll look at how we're going to use it in practice, and it's, it's a little bit easier than it looks. So this right here is called Taylor's Theorem, and Taylor's Theorem tells us exactly what the remainder is. And you may be saying, okay, if we know exactly what the remainder is, then um, that's great. We know exactly what the error is, and then we can figure out exactly the value. The problem is there is an unknown here in this formula, and the unknown is C. So we're centering this thing at A, at some A value, but what we're doing here is we're approximating the value of the function um, at some X value that's going to be close to A. So we have a, an interval here from A to X, or X to A, depending on which one's bigger. Um, so we have this interval here, and if we plug in there's some C value, and we don't know what the C value is. Um, sometimes we would be able to figure it out. We're never actually going to try to figure it out. Um, but there is some C value between the X and the A, some C value on the interval from where it's centered to where we're approximating it, that if we plug it in here, that's going to give us the exact value of the remainder. The problem is we don't know the C. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to figure out what's the biggest the remainder can be. So if we figure out the maximum value of the remainder, what we're doing is we're figuring out what the maximum value of the error is. And we want that error to be as small as possible. So if we figure out the maximum error, and that's smaller than uh, whatever we decide is acceptable as small, um, then, then we're in good shape. Um, if we find a maximum error that's bigger than what we want it to be, um, let's say we're trying to evaluate sine and we get an error of up to 2, 
well, that doesn't really help us because we know that sine is somewhere between negative 1 and 1 anyway. Um, so that kind of error doesn't help. But if we get an error that is like less than 1 1,000th, 1, then, then we're in good shape because we're rounding everything to the nearest thousand. Um, so we have to decide what kind, of, what kind of accuracy we want, and then we have to make sure that this remainder term has to stay below that. So what we're going to do to do that is we're going to just figure out what value between x and a gives us the biggest number, gives it the biggest remainder, and we're just going to say that's the maximum error. So the Lagrange error bound is given by this. This right here is the remainder term. And so the remainder is going to be less than or equal to the maximum value of that derivative evaluated at x um, on, the, on the interval. So this essentially is the same thing, but we're finding the maximum value of the derivative on the interval. So I should say here that this x is on the interval from uh, x to a.